You know, first, I just had a refresher of the three kinds of views of free will. Dualism, um, non-physiological non libertarian free will, which is basically that the mind is independent of the brain. This is what Dan is saying was dispelled a long time ago by everybody. Um, compatibilism, that free will is compatible with the idea of determinism or laws of physics. And I think that's what most of the people in this room are. I mean, we all agree that the laws of physics reign supreme. So the question is, given that and the form of determinism that that entails, um, do we still have free will? And then there's, in Dan is an advocate of compatibilism, as we all saw. Nobody in this room, but a lot of people in this society are advocates of um, non-physical libertarian free will. And finally, incompatibilism, which is my own view, that free will is not compatible with the idea of determinism or the laws of physics. Of course, this depends on what your definition of free will is when you adjudicate between the last two. And I would maintain that compatibilists have redefined free will from its traditional and indigenous meaning in society in a way to either, I mean, I think Dan's motivation might be the one to, to keep people from acting like beasts. As far as I can see, um, there are conflicting results between different scientific studies about whether people are innately dualists or not. Um, the people I've talked to, when you tell them that their decisions have already been made for them before they make them, are shocked. I mean, and when you question them more deeply, you realize that people seem to indeed think that they are agents and they can really make decisions. But that's just my personal experience. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm an incompatibilist. I think that I retain. The definition, of, this is my definition of free will. You have to have a definition of free will in order to be able to see whether you're compatibilist or incompatibilist. My definition used to be, at, which was similar to what Sean was talking about, if you put yourself in the same situation in the same universe with every molecule in the same place, free will would mean that you have the opportunity, that if you come to a decision point, you could make more than one decision. Okay, but then I realized that quantum indeterminacy of it acts on the neuronal level could make you make a different decision <laughs> under those circumstances, and it could even make you make a conscious different decision if that somehow that, that quantum indeterminacy somehow plays out in your consciousness. So I've taken this definition from Anthony Cashmore in his PNAS paper: the belief that there is um, something more than um, the consequences of your genes and your environment um, to your behavior. Um, and, and taking into account the possible stochastic effects. Sorry? I say that's a strange definition. Well, and all it is is it's, it's the physicalist or materialist definition of free will. Okay, well, I mean, you can yeah. contest this. These are, this is meant to be provocative, yeah. okay? Yeah. <laughs> and I also have to say that I freely admit that I'm not a philosopher and I'm, I've been accused of philosophical naivete and there's some truth in this. And also what I say about incompatibilism here is not necessarily aimed at the incompatible, sorry, at the compatibilists in this room. It's just sort of my take on the whole viewpoint. So first of all, let me, let me talk about what I think we all in this room agree on. And I think Dan's talk reinforced this, that there is no dualism, there's no ghost in the machine. The mind is the equivalent to the brain. Second of all, we don't have coining and free will in the sense that I say. Um, we, we can only make one decision at one time. I really think that's true. I, I, others argue about whether quantum indeterminacy can affect our behavior. I, as far as I can see, it, it doesn't, at least fr from you know, making decisions. Um, so we have to define free will differently to get compatibilism. Um, we can make no decisions other than the ones we do at a given moment unless quantum indeterminacy affects the decision process. If it doesn't, then I think we would all agree if we choose between vanilla or chocolate ice cream at any point, that decision has already been made for us before it reaches our consciousness. Gary, I think you maybe just short circuit things a little bit. You could deal with this quantum indeterminacy issue just by saying that there is an objective prediction about what you will do next, given by the yeah. factors you mentioned. It may be hundred percent or maybe probabilistic, but it's objective based on your atoms. Yes. Yeah, and that's what cash wants. I, I, you said we will agree. I don't agree with your last statement about chocolate and vanilla ice cream. I don't think that even on a completely non-dualistic point of view, that we uh, are that are that the, the decision is made that we will have chocolate or vanilla uh, before we consciously decide that. Okay. Well, there's some neuroscientific experiments. I mean, some people I'm, take issue with these about. 
that you can predict which button you're going to press with a certain yeah. degree of accuracy before you yeah. consciously decide which yeah. button. Yeah, well, you're we can press. discuss those in yeah. experiments, okay. but they, they're very in a very limited context. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, Pushing anyway, buttons. given the laws of physics, I I claim that this is almost an a priori truth. And finally, um, we're products of our genes and our environment some way. Okay. My problem with compatibilism is best expressed by Sam Harris. I mean, in some sense, I agree with Dan that we have a manifest image of free will. But I think it's, it's crucial to recognize the reality um, for other reasons. I mean, Dan wants to keep the manifest image because he thinks society will fall apart if we don't accept it. I think that there are pernicious consequences of of not recognizing determinism in terms of our decisions. And, and one, well, my problem is, is about you know, what's really going on. People feel that they're the authors of their decisions, and this is the only reason why there's a problem of free will worth talking about. That is, are we really the authors of our decisions? Dan says, no, we're not, but it doesn't matter. Okay, I no, say- No, I it, say we are the authors of our decisions. Okay, well- But that, we're perfectly material things. We're, we're moist right. robots who are the authors of our decisions. Well, in the same sense that a computer is an author of its decisions. Well, but we have to look closely at what kind of computer it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm almost done. Really <laughs> can, you, can you say more about that, Dan? Yeah, I will, but All right, okay. Okay. All right sorry. Um, so, I think there's a certain number of um, similarities between sophisticated theology, which is, this is deliberately meant to be provocative and not to really be insulting, but there are some similarities between theologians who don't recognize the truth of the Bible, but nevertheless tell it to their flock in order to keep them compliant, um, and compatibilism. The first one is um, that both define the old notions, in the case of theologians, biblical literalism, in the case of compatibilists, free will, and then claim that nobody really believes these anymore. There are plenty of compatibilists who say, nobody's really a dualist, <laughs> okay. Second of all, both set humans aside as special. Um, many compatibilists, I'm not sure the ones in this room, say that only humans have free will and animals don't, computers don't, et cetera. So we're set aside in that respect. Um, and in both cases, academic doyens sometimes say that it's dangerous for the public to know the truth um, either about you know the fact that our decisions are determined by our environments, our genes, or that you know maybe God exists as a ground of being rather than as an actual sky father out there. Okay, um, should we hide it from the public? Um, this is from Dan's Erasmus paper where he says explicitly that um, if neuroscience are saying that it is no use, we are already puppets controlled by the environments. They're making a big and potentially harmful mistake. But I think it's true that we are puppets. I mean, we are the puppets of our genes and our environment, and they completely determine what decision we make. So, um, there's another quote below that it's likely to have, which Dan just said, profoundly unfortunate social consequences. Um, and another quote, which Dan uh, made on the Point of Inquiry podcast in 2011, we don't want people disabling themselves with bad science. Um, I think this is a very serious issue. Well, I'm not sure that saying that determinism reigns or the laws of physics reign is bad science. And when I see a quote like this, it reminds me of something that Alex said yesterday. Um, my dear, descendant from the eights, let us, let us hope it's not true, but if it is so, let us hope it, not, it does not become generally known. I, let's keep the public unaware of determinism. Okay. Um, we don't really need to know this is, a, yeah. I, 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 is it time to? I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> this is my next to last slide. I'll tell you when it's <laughs> okay. This is a comment on one of our readers' blog. What we're up against: human will is not free, but we must say we must not say it is so. Um, uh, so two more slides, actually. Why, can, why I think that it is important to concentrate on more than just the manifest image in the case of free will. First of all, and Sean's going to object to this. But Dan, I think, might not, because he says we need to be politically aware of the uses of our language. That if you say we have free will, it somewhat enables religion by making it theists think that the form of free will as proposed by compatibilists is the same as their form of free will, which is truly dualistic. That is, you can choose whether or not to accept Jesus. It misses a critical issue, the absence of dualism and the hedge money of determinism and materialism, i.e. the brain is the mind. I think this is a very important message which we need to get out to the general public and yet, people who are compatibilists tend to neglect this and say, well, that, yeah, this is the truth, but you know, we have free will in this other sense. And it's, to me, it's much more important that the public realize this than that they have a conception of free will that comports with determinism um, for a number of reasons. Um, 
I think it. Did that last thing again? You say they have a conception of free will that comports with the Sorry? Is that you said it's more important that people believe that the mind is the brain than that they have a conceptual oh. free will. Okay. They can force with determinism, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I think it takes, it may have the danger of taking the science out of the question of free will. I mean, people tend to dismiss the live experiments and the sooner all experiments on grounds other than more substantial, as far as I can see them, that they don't like the results. Oh, no, uh, those are, those are, I, believe me, I will take those experiments all right. apart. All right, well, I mean, this is meant to be provocative and gender discussion. It has been done. Um, I think it sidesteps the questions of morality and moral responsibility. Are there, if we are truly deterministic in our decisions, does the concept of morality and moral responsibility have any meaning at all? I mean, maybe the concept of responsibility does but not moral responsibility. And I think the most important reason why we have to keep our eye on the true reality rather than the manifest image is because I think it has different consequences for retribution and punishment. I mean, whether or not you punish an 11-year-old for beating his little sister to death depends on what you think, whether you think, you know, what motivated that behavior or not, and did that person behave freely or not. Well, don't talk about an 11-year-old, talk about her. Talk, talk well, about anybody, anybody, Adolf. anybody. I mean, I think that your view of that, the view, your view of. The, remember, I'm not, I'm a philosophical tyro here. Okay, so I'm not going to pretend to know all the nuances. But com I think compatibilist free will completely neglects the question, uh, unless you start taking off. Well, will is really determined by our genes or environment. Neglects the very important question of how we're going to reform the judicial system of rewards and punishments based on what we know about neuroscience. Okay, that. And my modest proposal is that we get rid of the notion of free will completely and replace it by this statement, um, my, which is from Marvin Minsky. My decision was caused by internal forces I do not understand. And then the really interesting questions to me, which aren't about questions of compatibilism or incompatibilism, what are the effects of determinism on view of punishment and reward, philosophy and jurisprudence? Does moral responsibility mean anything beyond responsibility, i.e., you did it, you have to go to jail because you're the person that did it, not because you were wrong and you already had a choice. How far ahead can we predict decisions before they're made consciously? Um, the ambit of um, responsibility is science, philosophy, jurisprudence. Um, what are the factors that affect our decisions and how do they play out in the brain? That's a scientific question. And finally, which is a very interesting one, um, we have a feeling of agency, that is, we can actually make our brains make a choice, which, which we can't really. Um, is that feeling of agency a product of natural selection? Why do we feel that we are agents that have free choices? Is that an epiphenomenon, is that a spandrel, or is it something that has been installed in our brain by natural selection because, as some scientists think, the feeling of agency is an adaptive one?